Musical Talk, the UK independent musical theatre podcast. Hello, welcome to a very special episode of Musical Talk. Usually at this time of year, we will do a review of the year, but uh, we're going to hold that back for a few weeks because I wanted to put out the end of this decade, an interview that we did many, many years ago with the legendary Jerry Herman, who sadly passed away very recently. The audio quality isn't the best because we were, you know, we were 20 episodes in or something, which is amazing to think that we had such a wonderful guest on at that early stage within Musical Talk's history. But it's certainly listenable. It's certainly incredibly educative, entertaining and enlightening. And my thanks to Thos for um, providing the full unedited file of this interview. So enjoy it and uh, we shall see you next time decade. Thank you. Hello. Hello, Joe. It's Nick Hudson here from Musical Talk. Hi, Nick. I'm very nice to talk to you. Very nice to talk to you, too. Let me introduce you to my colleague. This is Thomas. Oh, hello, Mr. Herman. Hello. How are you? Very well, thank you. How long do we have for this interview? Oh, for, on my, from, from my uh, standpoint, as, 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 talk away. Splendid. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very comfortable and uh, I'm, I'm okay. Thank you very, very much. How are you? I'm really well and uh, just having a wonderful time of life. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting up there and, <laughs> and it's a little scary, but I'm, I'm healthy and that's the important thing. Good. Can we, um, may I ask you just a couple of questions to, before we start, actually, if sure. you don't mind? Um, what would you like to be referred to? Do you prefer Mr. Herman or Jerry? Or? Oh, Jerry. You're oh. happy with that? I'm very casual. Oh, yeah. good. Ever, I have to say all the references say you're the nicest man in the country, so, um, and, and you've proved it already. <laughs> That's nice to hear. And we probably ought to ask the question, is there any particular subject you don't want us to talk about? Uh, not really. I, I can't think of anything. Well, not, I don't think we were going to ask you anything particularly uh, offensive or controversial anyway, but, you know, just in case, we don't want to stray into any areas that you'd rather not talk about. No, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm perfectly, perfectly comfortable. <laughs> Great. Should we get this show on the road, then? Yes. Okay. We're joined here by the wonderful, uh, one of the best, uh, most respected Broadway composer and lyricist of all time, Mr. Jerry Herman, how are you? I'm very well and happy to happy to be back in London, even though it's on on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but your spirit lingers here anyway. Tell us what you've been up to at the moment, Jerry. Well, the newest thing in my life is a documentary of of my life and my work in the theatre. That's been five years in the making. A, a wonderful filmmaker named Amber Edwards uh, has been working on this for uh, the five years and has been interviewing people all all over the, the world, actually. And I just got to see it. I had absolutely nothing to do with it being put together. But I just got to see it, and I was very moved and and thrilled by it, and I'm going on a little tour with uh, Miss Edwards to um, to publicize it, to have it shown at film festivals and, and uh, places like that. So I've been busy with that. Is it rude to ask what that's called, please? Pardon me? What is that? Is it going to be called anything in particular? It's called Words and Music by Jerry Herman. How appropriate. A film by Amber Edwards. Do we have a, a, a release date for this? No, uh, it's going to be shown on public uh, uh, tel uh, television in in, uh, in this country sometime in the fall, but we don't have we don't have dates yet. Well, all the best of luck with that. It sounds brilliant, and I hope it comes over here sometime so we can watch that. I should be writing to the BBC. <laughs> that would be nice. Um, I have a, a one question for you. Uh, well, I have more than one question for you, Jerry. But um, one of my questions I've been burning to ask is, what was it like working with the, uh, I guess, controversial gentleman, David Merrick? Well, it was a very controversial <laughs> uh, subject for me as well, because there were times 
when he was just wonderful yeah. to me and wonderful to work with. I let me start by saying he he was probably our greatest producer. Today we have seventeen names on the top of a of a, mm. of, a of a playbill or a program. Uh, and in in those days it said David Merrick presents and he really was hands on in every department and did a splendid job and I have nothing but respect for him, but at the same time, he was very difficult, mm -hmm. and uh, he put me through a great deal of stress uh, when we were out of town with Hello Dolly, because I was very young, and he was unsure about whether I could, I could, I could uh, uh, rise to the occasion or not, and so... Uh, my my memories of him are very are very uh, two sided, uh, but basically I have to say that he I did two shows with him, so that tells you that after the bad experience I I did uh, Mac and Mabel with with uh, David producing, so uh, our personal relationship was ended very very uh, happily. And, and uh, we became good friends. Um, Jerry, I'm going to ask you a few questions, if I may, actually probably about your shows in order, um, if you're happy to answer those. And I'd like, if I may, to start immediately with uh, Milk and Honey, of course, which uh, in many ways is your first major Broadway hit. Uh, yes. 1961, I think. 1961, and it was a total joy. Uh, I had two... Uh, great voices, two voices from the, from the Metropolitan the Opera, uh, Robert Weedy and Mimi Benzel singing my songs, and I was I was really a, a kid, I was in, still in my 20s, and, um, and we had the wonderful Yiddish uh, uh, theater actress Molly Pecan, a delightful, uh, funny and charming lady. Uh, uh, with with those two gorgeous voices and a huge production and and chorus and and uh, wonderful choreography and it was a very very exciting a time for me because uh, before Milk and Honey I had only done some off Broadway uh, uh, shows and so suddenly I was in the midst of a huge and glorious orchestra hmm. and uh, you know and, uh, gorgeous sets and costumes and it was it was my my coming out party and it really was wonderful lovely experience on all counts it was very well received in uh, New York and by the critics and I was nominated for my first Tony Award which I didn't win but boy, to be nominated at that tender age was quite a quite a, 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 a thrill for me. A dream come true. Yeah. Can I ask what you think of the piece now? Because it's, I have to say, it's the elusive one of your scores. It's very hard to come by. Well, I, I love it very much. The, the main problem with it is what has happened with Israel, uh, which at the time I wrote it, uh, was a, was 13 years old and a, an exciting, vibrant, you know, a new new country, and because of uh, the controversy there, uh, a lot of, of theaters have have not wanted to go there, and that's the only reason that you haven't seen it or that that it hasn't been redone because uh, it's, it seems to be treading on, uh, uh, on controversial ground. It really is a, a charming piece and not in any way militant. It, it just the opposite, it's just about uh, a group of widows who go to Israel to, to, to look for husbands and, uh, and, and a romance that ensues there. And it's, it's just a charming, uh, piece with some some of my most 
melodic and, and lovely melodies. And uh, I'm hoping that that the international situation straightens out, not only for obvious reasons, but because I would love it to be uh, accepted uh, in theaters again. I'm going to ask you another question, if I may, about that period when you had Milk and Honey on in Broadway. Um, I understand you met Frank Lesser when you were 17 and he encouraged you to continue writing because he obviously saw that you had great talent. Um, but of course, Milk and Honey was on in 1961 when How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying was also on uh, on Broadway. I wonder, did he? Did you ever meet him again? And if so, did he um, have anything to say about the fact you were sort of rivals? Oh, yes, yes, he was, he was a, a constant supporter of mine. Good. And he would just, even if we just met for a moment at a at a Tony Award evening or at a, uh, a a party, he would just come over and shake my hand, and I would thank him profusely for uh, letting my parents uh, allow me to go into the business at at a tender age, because he uh, he encouraged them to encouraged me and uh, he was a great reason that uh, that uh, that I'm in this business could I ask you now about hello Dolly of course which uh, your name will always be connected with forever and um, wonderfully so if I may say um, I believe that you wrote the score um, originally for H Ethel Merman who unfortunately yes. declined it originally and then took it up rather later in its run I just wondered, you've obviously had lots of uh, lead women in your um, in all your musicals. Yeah. How do you, as the cast changes, how do you tailor the scores for them? No. Uh, the wonderful thing about Hello, Dolly! was we had in succession on Broadway Carol Channing, Ginger Rogers, Betty Grable, Pearl Bailey, Martha Ray, Phyllis Diller, and Ethel Merman. And Mary Martin was doing the same show at the same time in uh, London and in uh, Vietnam. And Eve Arden was doing it in, in Chicago. And I didn't have to change a note or a word for any of these women because their own personalities melded with Dolly's. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the show had... had had slightly different, uh, uh, a slightly different character with each one of those women without having to change anything. Could I ask, um, now the show was originally going to be called, I believe, Dolly, a damned exasperating woman. That's right. Yes, I was going to say, what do you think, um, how important is a good title? It's very important. Uh, uh, actually, the show would have been referred to as Dolly which still is, you know, in, in many uh, shortened uh, uh, variety headlines, for example. But um, the song, Hello, Dolly, was intended to be, as it still is, uh, a, a welcome home to a woman who had locked herself away after the death of her husband and her return to to life actually she puts on her feathers and and her red dress which she hasn't worn in in a decade or more and she comes back uh symbolically to 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 this restaurant where she used to go with her husband but it's really about returning to the human race and i never never thought that that number would be a popular song because it was very 1890s and it began hello harry well hello louis she was talking to her friends the waiters and uh louis armstrong turned that song into an international hit and made uh, our producer say to me, well, you ha we have to call the show Hello, Dolly, because we've got this hit record on our hands. Makes sense. And of course, I was delighted by the change. But it really it really came because of Louis Armstrong's recording. 
it's interesting that you were talking about the the journey of the central character Dolly because um, obviously that is core to the story and, and you brought that out in your score um, I believe the story can actually be traced back to 1835 and a book called A Day Well Spent. How important, and how do you select a book, and how can you tell if it's suitable well, for musicalization? That, in, in the case of Dolly, uh, David Merrick uh, approached me, and I had uh, never seen any of the earlier versions, uh, and I had not even seen The Matchmaker with uh, Ruth Gordon in the title role when it was a play and uh, when I had heard about his interest in me uh, I was very excited because I had written uh, two years before I had written this Israeli operetta <laughs> because that was what was appropriate for the uh, milk and honey material and I couldn't be more American my parents were teachers in, in the New York school system, and I knew that this was right for me, but Mr. Merrick didn't. He, he only knew my work from Milk and Honey and, and admired it, and very honestly said to me, I'm not sure whether you're American enough. So I decided that I would take it upon myself to uh, write a, a, a few songs uh, I wrote four actually uh, over the period of a weekend wow. to to uh, be able to show him what what my my 1890s Americana work would sound like and I got the job uh, based on that uh, audition that I did with those songs which uh, I took upon myself to do because uh, having had a uh, uh, having have had a, a hit uh, show on running on Broadway, uh, my agents would not have been very happy to have me uh, audition for you know a new show. But I wanted that job, as the guy says in the chorus line. <laughs> I I knew that. Uh, that, that I could do that material and uh, it, 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 it was a, uh, a very a very exciting day when he turned when he stood up behind his desk after hearing the songs I had written and said kid the show is yours <laughs> that's wonderful I mean I mean, I, the fact that you can write four great songs in a weekend, in a weekend yes. is, um, I have to say, you've, you've knocked us rather dumbstruck here. What, 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 what were those four songs? I mean, they, they uh, am I right, on, three or put so? On your, put on your Sunday clothes was right. the first one I wrote. And it was... How long did that take? Oh, well, I was working on uh, all the songs simultaneously, so... I would write a bit of, of put on your Sunday clothes, and and then I'd go back to uh, dancing the the the, the walls with, where uh, Dolly teaches Cornelius how how to dance, and the whole 14th Street uh, waltzes along with her. Uh, and then I'd go to uh, 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 her opening number. Uh, I put my hand in. Which I felt was important for me to to show because it tells who she is and what she does for a living. That she matches people up and and that's that's her uh, 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 and it shows her garrulousness that she cannot stop talking. <laughs> and uh, it was it was constant work. I worked long into the night. Uh, had a few hours sleep, worked the next day, called a, 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 a lady friend of mine uh, who uh, sang with me and taught her uh, two of the songs so that we could make a, a, a better impression than just having me sing the songs myself. I've heard so you, or some of your singing on the um, the album of um, I think it's Maine. Yes, and yes. I have to say I think you sing very well. Oh, thank you, but but you know it, I didn't want to bore them with uh, with with one voice. So 
uh, uh, that girl that's on the album of, of Maine, uh, Alice Bort, uh in fact, I had dinner with her <laughs> two nights ago, is still my, my, one of my very dearest friends, and she was very kind and went with me, and on Monday morning, we had a little show in Mr. Merritt's office. What was the uh, fourth song, then? Uh, the fourth song was a song for Mrs. Malloy. Uh, it was like a little Irish ballad uh, about the fact that she still loved uh, her her uh, her first love, which who was her first husband. And uh, I I later uh, got the idea from a line of Thornton Wilder's dialogue about uh, uh, writing a song called Ribbons Down My Back from uh, a line of dialogue that said this this summer we'll be wearing ribbons down our back uh, 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 to catch a bow I suppose and it just gave me such a wonderful picture that I knew I had to write uh, that song and I replaced the, uh, the, uh, the uh, ballad the Irish ballad with ribbons down my back. I have to say that the fact that three out of four songs written in the weekend made it into the show is uh, just just incredible. When people, I have to say this, it's going to sound awfully creepy, but uh, when people say you're a genius, it's very clear that that's the case. Well, I'll tell you something. When you want something very badly and you have, uh, you have youth uh, on your side, I don't think I could do it today, but I wanted to to assure this man that I was the right person for, for the job. Wow. And so a lot of it came from from determination and youth, and that's a very powerful combination. <laughs> I remember my youth well. <laughs> um, may I ask you, moving on to Maine, um, which of course was an equally... <laughs> an equally I'm sorry, we've just knocked something over at this end, I apologise. Um, moving on to Maine, uh, which of course was an equally huge hit um, in 1966 and indeed I believe you'd interpolated some songs into Ben Franklin in Paris in the year before must have given you a sense of um, confidence which uh, and being on the shoulders if you like of Hello Dolly how, how did you find that your approach for Mame was different? Well it was much much more sophisticated material the Dolly material was very uh, 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 Corn fed Americana, and uh, and it was you know the the period was 1890, so I was I was working within those you know restrictions, and Maine suddenly was the 1920s and the 1930s when uh, when this country was uh, just having having itself a. a, a wonderful celebration uh, and uh, uh, the Charleston period and the uh, the, uh, the 30s were, were very glamorous times so it was a, a very different uh, approach to, to, to songs and a song like If He Walked Into My Life uh, would have been so completely out of place uh, in, in uh, a show like The Matchmaker. So the style was extremely different. And uh, Mame was, by without any question, the happiest uh, and most satisfying experience I ever had in the theater. And Angela Lansbury, uh, uh, the, the, your, your great uh, countryman, uh, 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 We're very happy to share her with you. Uh, <laughs> well, we thank you for her. She she is such a great lady, and she is one of my closest friends uh, uh, today and throughout the period, you know, from 1965 when I first met her. Well, and it was just a joyous, joyous time because when the show tried out in Philadelphia... The first night, I knew what I had there, and it was overlong, and it needed some judicious cutting. 
but that's all it needed. I never added anything to it, and we just we just gently cut it as we uh, as the as the performances continued, and we came in with a roaring hit. And it was just it was just a wonderful time, and I had Dolly running at the same time, so it was <laughs> it was a, a heyday. You've also had, uh, as well as Angela Lansbury, you had uh, B. Arthur in the cast and the fantastic oh, song yeah. Bosom Buddies, which is still a hilarious song and makes me laugh every time I hear it. And that's not true of a lot of comic songs. Well, it was it was a, just a joy. B. B. is also a very close friend, and B. and Angela have remained close friends. So we always look back at that period with the, the most affection and uh, and our producers were wonderful and it was it was there, I had nothing negative that I could possibly say about the, the entire main experience Well you worked with Angela Lansbury again on your next show which was Dear World now yes. that didn't receive quite the same critical reception no, but it, it does have a huge cult following Yes it has a great following uh, 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 the record album is still being ordered and played, and uh, but it was it was really an experiment. I wanted, and and Angela wanted to do something different. She she, she had done her uh, uh, high kicks, and she had worn the most stunning wardrobe and. She, she, she was ready for a departure, as, as was I. And uh, I had always loved the mad woman of Shio, and you can't get further away from Maine than going from anti-Maine to the mad woman of Shio. And uh, uh, I wrote a score that I'm very proud of and that was totally different from my previous work. But the critics really uh, did not accept it. They uh, they didn't like seeing um, Angela uh, uh, playing a, 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 an elderly uh, mad countess, and um, the audiences really were uh, 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 hostile to everything that we were doing, and it was. It was a, a, a major failure, and uh, and was very difficult to uh, to live through. But uh, once once the show closed on Broadway, uh, people started finding the album and listening to it and listening to it, and my my mail uh, doubled or tripled. Uh, uh, people saying, "Why did that show, you know, not find an audience?" And uh, I'm I'm still uh, looking toward redoing that, mounting it again because it has uh, it has a, 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 a clearer and and uh, and more accessible book today. We've been working on it and. Uh, and I've, re, uh, I've added a couple of songs that I had originally written and, and cut from the, uh, from, from the uh, Broadway production. And uh, it's still alive. And, <laughs> and one day we may see Dear World again. Well, I, I hope so, because I happen to think yes. it's an excellent score. I'd like to ask you actually a bit about the mechanics of the writing then, because you quite rightly say that you're looking to revise it and you're working on it. It had 59 previews quite famously, which is a, a lot, um, yes. and that must have been extremely grueling for you, but how do you decide when a song needs to be cut or just revised and changed? Well, we would, we, but I do this with every show. Uh, after a, 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 a certain amount of previews, the, the creative team meets and discusses how we all feel about uh, uh, the audience reaction we've had to to uh, different parts of, of, of the show or to specific songs, and um, 
and we 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 do work. We do we go out of town for the purpose of working. And I I for example knew that I had uh, never addressed the the fact that when when the the, the countesses when the mad woman's friends tell her that the world is no longer the lovely place that she perceives it to be that she has to she has to put her hand up and say no uh, 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 I, I don't want to believe that and uh, and uh, it was a very important uh, step in the in the uh, in the story that I had neglected to write a song about and so in Boston, in a hotel room, I wrote, I don't want to know, which, when we put it in the show, stopped the show cold because of Angela's delivery of that song, and really, really strengthened the entire show. So, you know, we kept working on it, and I do that with every show. If, if there's a weak place in it, whether it's part of the book or part of the score or part of the choreography, we all meet and, 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 and work. I believe you're on record as saying that you don't much like the title, Dear World. Would you, are you planning to change that in your revisions? Well, it's very difficult to change it now hmm. because the, 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 the people who love the score know it as Dear World, and if it's suddenly called tomorrow morning or, or one of the other uh, uh, lines from the from the score or from the uh, script I, I think it would be very confusing so I think I'm stuck with that title but I don't like that title song and uh, in a new version I would not use that song oh that's interesting why is that uh, it was written to be sung by a by a little boy and so it's it sounds a little bit like a like a greeting card. <laughs> and funny enough, I always think it sounds a little bit like an ecological anthem. It um, ties in very well currently do. with well, the world. Maybe, maybe because it was attacked when I when I uh, first presented it to the New York critics. Uh, I have I have a negative feeling about it, but uh, maybe today with with the uh, ecological problems of the world, it would make a very strong statement. So may maybe maybe I, I should do some thinking about it myself. <laughs> I'd like to move on now to Mac and Mabel, which of course yes. um, in Britain is hugely popular. And uh, I, I think when we talk about it, we'll show that it has a, a longer term happy ending uh, as a production. But I want to say, why do you think it's so popular here in Britain? It was because of the wonderful skaters um, uh, Torval and Dean they used the um, overture from the uh, uh, cast album of Mac and Mabel to skate to uh, when they won their Olympic gold and the, the uh, BBC was inundated with calls asking what that music was that they were skating to and where they could buy it. And it caused the record company uh, to re-release the album. And the album actually became very high on the charts in, in uh, Great Britain. And I suddenly was, was, was told to hear that I had uh, a hit album in, in London. And uh, your wonderful audience has simply found Mac and Mabel and turned it in to a cult hit in, in London. I mean, on a personal level, I have to say I think it's one of your most consistently witty um, scores, both lyrically and musically, and I'd like to ask you a bit about your lyrics, actually. I mean, in that, there's one song in that particularly, Look What Happened to Mabel. You rhyme meticulous with ridiculous, and then splendidly later on, ambitious, uh, bagels and Canisius, and then finally St. Aloysius, which is just incredible to me. <laughs> so what are the secrets of writing a good lyric? Well, the secret of writing a good lyric is, first of all, knowing how. 
and don't ask me how I know how. <laughs> <laughs> it helps know I, how, yes. It, because if I could tell you how to do it, then you you would be able to do it just as well. So, uh, but the secret is having a, a, a wonderful character to work from. And that's really what what my shows are about, are, are the great characters that emerge. And, uh, you know, r writing a, an anti-love song made I Won't Send Roses one of the most important songs I've ever written. But it was because I needed a song for a man who didn't know how to say I love you. And that was a very tough assignment. And the, the idea of I won't send roses or hold the door, I won't remember which dress you wore, and then ending with I won't send roses and roses suit you so, that, that came from having this unusual character to work from and really uh, just, just uh, made me right. Uh, an interesting song, probably the most interesting love song I've ever written. May I just ask, Cole Porter quite often used to write his last line first but then work backwards so he knew it was going to finish well. That song, as you quote so rightly say, has that final line, and roses suit you so, which really gives that song its heart and uh, tells precisely what the character is doing. Would you say that, you, uh, how did you reach that last lyric, that last line? I, I, I went to it immediately. I, when I got the idea of the first four lines, the next thing I wrote was, and roses suit you so. And then I filled in the middle. I really work as if I were doing a jigsaw puzzle. I don't write in order. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and uh, if you notice, a lot of my my closing lines uh, are are exclamation points, like "There'll be no blue Monday in your Sunday clothes," or "Dolly will never go away again." A dolly will never go away again. Exactly. Uh, so I do I do find my what I call bookends, and uh, and very often fill them in. I have a question, uh, Jerry. Um, in your mind, what is the secret to writing a good melody? Well, what I do is, if I write a new melody, I don't jot it down, I don't put it on tape, I just keep it in my head. Yeah. And if it stays in my head, for the next week or so and if it keeps me up at night especially I, I feel that I've written a good melody and I use I use that very uh, 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 unsophisticated uh, uh, method of deciding whether to keep a melody or not it's how how it how it stays in my brain or sometimes uh, what I thought was a lovely melody, I, I have trouble finding the next day, and of course I don't I don't go back there. You know. Of course, you're noted for famously saying at the Tony Awards when you won for the Casual Foal that um, uh, some people believe that the uh, catchy melody no longer exists on Broadway, but it's alive at the Palace, which is actually a quote I um, put in my essay a couple of weeks ago because. Um, it's a very interesting thing that, that the catchy melody is still very, very important for Broadway. Well, I, I, I don't know how important they are today because uh, Broadway has changed so drastically. We, we now have what we call jukebox musicals, and they're not original songs at all. You no. know, what? You, what? You, you know uh, the Mamma Mia's, they're wonderful shows and very successful. But uh, it's a different kind of Broadway in, in a great sense. Yeah. Of course. Um, I was just going to say, you've, I think you've described your shows uh, as your children in many ways, and you sometimes say that Mac and Mabel's your favourite. Um, it certainly is, I think, in Britain. Why is it your favourite? It's Mac and Mabel. <laughs> <laughs> it's still Mac and Mabel. I love La Cage very much, and it's a very, very close second or maybe 
maybe in the same uh, 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 category as Beck and Abel. Uh, it, I, I, I love I love the melodies. I love the lyrics. Of the ly- I think the lyric of uh, a little more mascara is one of my very best examples of of good internal rhyming and all the things I like about writing lyrics. Can I ask you now about your next uh, major piece, which is the Grand Tour, 1979, uh, with Joel Grey in it? Um, I mean, obviously the 60s have been excellent for you. Yes. Um, and the Grand Tour is a very good piece, but it, I have to say it seems to have been either ignored or critically misunderstood, and in, indeed many of your things in the 70s seem to have suffered that. Um, there's a song which opens, I think, the Grand Tour, I'll Be Here Tomorrow. Is there any personal significance to that song? Well, it wasn't when I wrote it. I wrote it to, to, to explain the, uh, the uh, optimism uh, of, of this little Jewish man who's running from the Nazis. And it was a perfect uh, uh, song for him and uh, remains a perfect song for him. But after having had three shows in the 70s that weren't the monster hits that I was spoiled by and used to, uh, I'll Be Here Tomorrow did become my personal anthem without my realizing it. Moving on once again to a comedy song that you wrote. Uh, You wrote... Um, I think three songs for a rather odd little sort of review I suppose it would be called A Day in Hollywood A Night in the Ukraine a kind of cod Marx Brothers musical and there's a song called Just Go to the Movies which is just a a wonderful comic tour de force do you care to comment on that? Well uh, two very close friends of mine Alex Cohen who was the producer of Dear World and Tommy Toon who I had been just a a personal friend of Uh, both called me from Baltimore uh, Maryland and where they had this review uh, trying out and they they said the the people who wrote the the, uh, show have just uh, stopped working on it and 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 didn't know what what to do with it and they felt that it was a potential hit, but that it needed a, an, an opening number, and it needed two other pieces of material. And would I come to Baltimore to to look at it? And I said, I really hate the idea of adding things to other people's shows. It just is just uh, terrifies me. And uh, they promised me that these. These, these gentlemen who had written it would be happy to have me come and, and take a look. So I got on um, a, 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 a train, went to Baltimore, and saw this this uh, review, and knew that it needed uh, to tell the audience that the whole first act was going to be about old movies. And uh, I went home, and it's, it's a, it was a very uh, happy subject for me to attack. And I went to my piano and wrote that song so quickly with all the imagery of uh, 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 think of one of them, uh, uh, see Scarlet make a dress out of the drapes. Uh, or just all the all all the pictures mm. of, of all our famous films. Uh, it was a joy to write, and a, a very humble melody, one that still keeps me up at night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your week-long and, process really proven there, then. <laughs> and uh, and then I wrote two other pieces of special material, and went back to uh, Baltimore. Uh, uh, the next week with the, with the three songs and they were put in and the show came in and was a big hit and um, I, I never liked to do that but these were two people I couldn't say no to because they were they were friends 
and I'm very happy that I that I got a chance to write Just Go to the Movies. And you are, in your own right, a, a large movie fan, aren't you? Oh, yes. Uh, I, I'm going to quote a lyric at you, if you don't mind, from that song. And all for the sum of a quarter, life is peachy. You can become Alice Faye or Don Amici. <laughs> Uh, I like that because I know who they all are but it's, um, I, I, it's the whole song is just a list of good comedy couplets I think yeah yeah. now then there was a kind of um, you just mentioned jukebox um, musicals I don't think this could possibly be described as such but next you had Jerry's Girls yes uh, um, a producer came to me and, and said we would like to do a compilation of of uh, uh, all your material and honor the fact that in most cases you've written for 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 uh, the female, and it's true. I I I would much rather write for a lady in a in a in a spangled dress than for a man in a brown suit. I've been <laughs> quoted <laughs> saying that many many times. Coming down a staircase. And and uh, so. Uh, we we put together a show uh, uh, with with most of the of the of the songs that that the the ladies had had sung in my in, in my uh, uh, career, and it was a lovely lovely evening, and uh, has played uh, all all over the world, and and was uh, has played three times in Australia to great success and um, that that was great fun because I got to work with the great Cheetah Rivera and the great Leslie Uggams who uh, really has one of the finest voices in the, in the musical theater and uh, the late Dorothy Loudon who was a wonderful clown wonderfully funny lady and a, a, a beautiful chorus of, of, of Pretty girls, and uh, it was it was a delightful experience. I'm going to move now on to La Cajo Fall, of course, which is another oh, yes. monster hit for you, 1983. Um, Arthur Lawrence was the director on that, very very famous and well respected director, and he said it was agitprop in sequins. Would you <laughs> would you agree with that? Say, say that line again. Well, Arthur Lawrence apparently said it was agitprop in sequins. I wonder if you agree. <laughs> no, I really don't. Uh, Arthur, Arthur was 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 a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, part of of uh, of Lacage. He he um, he was a very power. Is a very powerful force in in in, in the theater and was was. Uh, someone I had always wanted to work with. Uh, he, his his book for Gypsy and West Side Story are legendary, and I wanted him to write this uh, musical with me. And what he what he what he ended up saying was that he didn't want to write the script but that he would love to direct it. And so what I, what, what I, what I was thrilled about uh, was that I got to work with him in an even closer uh, 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 capacity because he was the man in charge of putting that show on the stage and he did a stunning job. And together we found a Harvey Firestein uh, a young, uh, at that time, new playwright who uh, just seemed like the perfect uh, person to, to join the two of us and turned out to be that perfect person. And, and uh, that, was a, that was a very joyous experience. I mean, I think, if you don't mind me saying, I mean, The Cajo Falls is really quite an astonishing and brave piece for 1983. Uh, which was really a very conservative time in American politics. Um, did you think at the time it was going to succeed? I knew that it was controversial, and I knew that I was standing on shaky ground. 
actually for for the first time because everything else I had done, maybe with the exception uh, uh, exception of uh, Mac and Mabel, was based on a, a, a famous piece of work. Uh, even even the Grand Tour was based on a very successful play by S. N. Behrman, and um, and I knew that in this case we were dealing with a subject matter that had not been really seen on the musical stage, and I didn't care because I thought it was a wonderful story and a, a very human story. And I thought it was it had great family values because it was about two people who brought up a a, a, a son uh, to to believe in everything that you know they want him to believe in, and who turned out to be uh, uh, engaged to find himself engaged to uh, the daughter of the most bigoted man uh, in, uh, in 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 the country. And um, and uh, it, it became a very very human family story about how uh, uh, they handled this situation, and the fact that the two people involved were both male made it controversial. Yes. <laughs> and there are there are people who accepted that, and there are pe there are people who will never accept that. But what happened was that the audiences who, who came into the theater skeptical about seeing a show with uh, boys dressed as, 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 as girls and kicking their, their, their heels uh, left the theater having fallen in love with the two guys because they were both uh, uh, adorable characters and without knowing it they had maybe changed some of their perceptions about about gays and it it really ended up being a, a very important statement but I want to make it very clear that we didn't write the show to be a militant statement we wrote it because the French film and play was so uh, charming and so funny and so lovable and uh, I was just doing my job as a musical playwright, but it turned out to have uh, even greater uh, implications. Well, it's so that was a very happy experience. Well, it certainly survived its period. I mean, it's still revived and listened to today, and therefore oh, it's sort it, of not pickled in aspic of at 1983. At the present time, it's playing in so many obscure places in the world. It's playing in Slovakia. I'm not even sure where Slovakia is. <laughs> <laughs> But there's a production there, and uh, the world has accepted that, which it, which pleases me, of course, on many levels. And it's ladle full of comedy as well. I mean, yeah. there's a great lyric. Um, it's when you're when they're trying to persuade uh, uh, Alban to um, be more manly, and uh, you say, or rather, Jor says, it'll take all your strength and steady nerves for hacking your way through the cherry preserves over breakfast. <laughs> I love that because he. He's buttering his toast with a very effeminate of right hand with his pinky up, and that line is sung by George in in his most masculine uh, 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 tones. And yeah, I, I I love that line too. You you've chosen all the <laughs> the things I, I really well love. <laughs> I'm very flattered, but I hope you put all the work in, really, if you don't mind me saying. Um. Of course, you've had many of your great musicals turned into films. Sadly, La Cage Fall was turned into The Birdcage a few years later, which I'm afraid I don't think is as nearly as rich as uh, your excellent musical. And of course, it did have a score by Stephen Sondheim. Were you approached for that, or...? No. Uh, no, of course not, because I, they would have done my score had they wanted to do a musical. But it really didn't have a score, it just had some uh, uh, songs uh, uh, thrown in, but it wasn't it wasn't done as a as a as a musical. I think Lacage Fall is going to be better remembered by posterity. I have to say, um, this is a, almost a frivolous question. I was just idly looking at the album 
the other day and I noticed that Pan Am Airlines is listed as being the official airline of La Cajo Foll. Um, is there any reason for that? Uh, they they wanted to to uh, log on and 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 support it, and they uh, they uh, let us use their airline for uh, uh, some commercial purposes if we if we uh, uh, you know use their name in our program, and what they were really doing was lending support to to uh, this controversial project. And uh, we had our opening night party in the Pan Am building <laughs> on Park Avenue, and it was a wonderful space. One almost thinks of Tran Am, perhaps, under the circumstances. No. Um, I'd like to move on now to Mrs. Santa Claus, which has become a Christmas perennial. I mean, um, I'd like to ask, though, what are the differences in writing a score for television, because it was a television movie, rather than writing one for the stage? Well, there was really very little difference in, in, in my approach to writing, uh, but um, I don't think that it's as strong a piece of work as I would have written if it had been for the stage. And um, it's, it's, not, it's not among my, my favorites. <laughs> oh, that's interesting because it's it's on every Christmas, and I was I was going to say, but in many ways, you've written the modern equivalent of the Wizard of Oz. Oh, good, good. I'm glad. I'm glad to know that. Uh, it it has a wonderful performance by Miss Lansbury. What was it like working with Angelo again? Oh, it's such a delight. I I, I just don't know how to tell you. She embodies everything that that a great uh, star. Uh, should 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 uh, mm. have. She is loved by by the by the company and by the people that she works with. She is uh, completely uh, 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 at, 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 at. She is completely willing to try anything that I that I throw at her. If if I if I ask her to sing something in a in a different key or or uh, learn a new song overnight, she's game. She's she's just the most professional and 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 darling lady. I I could I could do a whole uh, half hour with you on 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 that lady. I mean, forgive me. We are taking up a lot of your time. Are you still happy to continue talking for a bit? I, I don't uh, want to put any um, times. Uh, if, if you could wind it, uh, uh, if you could wind it up a, a bit, it would, it would be helpful to me. Well, should we just briefly touch then on Miss Spectacular, uh, which I think is a very lively score. Obviously, a concept album um, with some really upbeat, great songs, and I'd like to pay particular tribute to Las Vegas, which uh, I have to say, if I was asking somebody to sing a song that was in the style of Sinatra, uh, then that's the piece I'd direct them to. Yes, uh, uh, it's still waiting for the right theater and the right time because I only wanted to be done in Las Vegas. It was written for that purpose. You know, I've had lots of requests to do it as a, as a Broadway musical or as a touring musical and I've always said no. It, it, it really belongs in the nightclub and, um, and, and we're still waiting to, 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 to find the right, the right venue. But uh, I enjoyed writing that very, very much, and uh, 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 and I like that album. I like the concept of having a different person sing each each song, and uh, we selected a cast that we thought would be perfect, and they all said yes. So uh, I ended up with an album that I'm very proud of. I mean, in many ways, that piece it is about a young lady who sort of lives out her fantasies and you you mention fantasy island on land in it sort of suggesting there's an emptiness of fame um but you've had a, a tremendously long and distinguished career I, I how would you sum up your career because i'm sure you'll be going into posterity i would have to say that i i have been blessed because uh i i was i started out in life by, by wanting to be an architect 
and uh, went to a, a design school and just couldn't stop writing songs as a, as a hobby until the day that my mother sent me to Frank Lesser, who changed my, my direction completely. And it was just a blessing because uh, to, you can't imagine how it feels to stand in the back of the theater and hear people humming your melodies on the way out and being totally anonymous, just standing in, 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 in the shadows in the back and hearing them, them, them hum on the way out. That's the most satisfying part of my life. So I have been blessed. Certainly. I'd just like to say, I mean, that's it's been a, a real privilege to speak to you, uh, Jerry. I have to say that you've, you've been very generous with your time and spoken about so many different things and illuminated many areas. I have to say that we're all interested in musical theatre, and yes. you are musical theatre. So on well, a personal level, I'd like to so thank you. Thank you so you're, much. You're, you're a wonderful interviewer, and uh, you make me say things that I really wanted to have wanted to say you're so, too kind uh, but thank you very much thank you very very much jerry thank you bye bye thank you very much and there you have it the full unedited interview with broadway legend jerry herman i'm recording this on new year's eve and i will be raising a glass to his legacy tonight thank you very much for listening to musical talk for all these uh, well for, for two decades now almost crikey um we shall see you in 2020 i'm off to broadway in january so i'm sure i have a lot to talk about until then happy new year and bye-bye for more information about musical talk please visit our website at musicaltalk.co.uk you can email us at feedback at musicaltalk.co.uk listen to past episodes on itunes and youtube and follow our social media channels on facebook twitter and instagram 